What's going on? Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week for another episode of the Reseller Greatness Podcast. Today, we have a familiar face for some folks. We have Caleb, Phoenix Resale. And I'm going to tell you right off the jump, Caleb, when I told my son you sent me a DM, and when I told him you were getting on the podcast, I was the man. I have so <laughs> many brownie points today for getting Caleb, Phoenix Resale on the podcast. Dude, I could brag about this for the rest of my life. My son thinks I'm the man today. So I love um, to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for folks that don't know you, give them a little bit of a background, where you're from, what you do, what you have going on, where you sell, what you sell. Mm -hmm. And then we can get started with um, a, a very valuable conversation, I believe, because you are, are one of the rare ones who has a huge social media business and also a huge reselling business. And that is very, very, very difficult to pull off both. So I want to give you props for being able to do both. But being able to do both, there's got to be a lot of work and a lot of knowledge and, and a lot going on in the background. And that's what I want to talk about. So thank you for yeah. joining us this week and over to you. Well, I appreciate the generous intro. I, uh, by the way, I'm rocking my little vintage uh, Fantasmic shirt today in honor Let's of you go. and your business. So Let's go. Yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know me, um, my channel is called Phoenix Resale, and I make videos about buying, selling, and collecting video games. And uh, flipping stuff in general started out part-time for about a year, around five years ago. For the last four years, I've been doing it full time. I started out actually flipping books from thrift stores and yard sales and, uh, you know, book sales. Eventually got kind of broader into like just yard sailing in general, dabbled in a lot of categories and then honed in on video games when I realized that um, there was a disproportionate opportunity within that niche specifically on Amazon. And uh, I could often get higher than market rates, which provided more opportunities and uh, I started niching down in that, I would say, late 2019. Then, of course, 2020 came around and there were even more opportunities to buy not just um, like collections and onesie twosie at pawn shops, but from video game stores, because a lot of stuff, especially online, was selling for crazy prices. Um, so I would make routes not just of pawn shops, but of actual local game stores and uh, buy a bunch of stuff that definitely helped me out early on. And since then, I've focused much more on um, networking with other resellers, trying to uh, buy as much as we possibly can first through a buy list program and now through an app um, to allow us to do primarily business to business purchasing and then selling direct to consumer through Amazon. Um, I started out the business five years ago with 500 bucks uh, and, you know, birthday and Christmas money that I cobbled together while Erica was in law school, my wife. Nice. And uh, last year, we just did a 1.1 million in video game sales on Amazon. So really nice. proud of where it's come in that time. About four years ago, around the time that I started going full time, I also started the YouTube channel because I learned to flip watching YouTube videos, guys like Craigslist Hunter and Cincinnati Picker, uh, watching them go out to yard sales and just thinking, you know, I don't think they're that much smarter than me. I think I could maybe start doing this myself. I kind of want to try it out. I was looking for a side hustle. We had almost no money. Uh, we're looking to get out of our studio apartment. And so that was how I got into it and eventually felt like I'm going to try my hand making videos too. And maybe I can, uh, you know, add my own spin on stuff. And if nothing else, maybe it'll get me some leads for like buying people's video game collections. If they, you know, know that I'm buying video games. And so I started posting a couple videos a week for gosh, about three years. Um, now my upload schedule is a little bit lower, but I really try to just show my journey and be honest about the highs and the lows and teach people what I'm learning along the way. I definitely am, uh, no expert, but I, I like to share my learnings as I go. So. Absolutely. Great introduction right there. And there, there's a lot to build on right there. So, um, my first question is you've been in the group for probably like a year now. And when I saw you in the group, I was a little bit surprised that, you know, someone, your business size, someone who knows exactly what they were doing. So this is a selfish question. Mm. Why did you join the group? Because we talked a little bit earlier. You actually listen to the calls. You you, you know mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Like what kind of like for you, you like to teach. I, I like to help people. I, I, I like to I like to teach as well. But like someone who is as far as you are, it, it was kind of shocking for me to see your face in the group. But I do appreciate you being in there. But like 
Why, why, why did you join the group? I, I'm, that's a curious question for me. Yeah, totally. A few people may be surprised to learn that. And so apologies to everyone for mostly being a lurker. Um, <laughs> I am most consistently in the uh, video game call, but I watch the replay of it because yeah. it's like Friday night and, and I usually try not to work then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been in that very consistently. And the biggest reason why is I think a huge reason why I've continued to be able to grow both social and uh, the resale business is I'm just obsessed with getting 1% better every day. Same. Um, and so regardless of where I am in my journey, I know I've got a bunch of stuff to learn from other people, even who like maybe are earlier on in their journey, they could be figuring stuff out that I'm not really thinking about the right way. Yeah. And so that like hunger for more knowledge and to constantly iterate and improve on the systems that I'm putting in place, I think is, is the biggest reason that uh, we haven't had a significant plateau yet in the business. Granted, you know, it's only been four or five years, so we've got a long way to go. Nice. Um, but I'm pretty obsessed with uh, with just getting better as much as I can. So I love resources like this. And, and just for me, I just want to be absorbed with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to hear people talking about it. Just Just listen to it almost 24 hours a day to the point where like it might be a sickness. Like I just want to just mm -hmm. listen to just people talking about doing what I do, even right. if I even if I know already, I just want to listen to it. So, OK. All right. So you started doing video games um, or you started doing books. You moved into video games when you saw that there was an arbitrage between how you can get them and selling them online. Did you start selling video games on eBay before you went to Amazon or did you go straight to Amazon? Uh, it was both at the same time at first. So. I opened up my Amazon account pretty early because that was how I was selling books. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, there were a couple channels early on that I was watching, just learning how to go to a thrift store and like scan a whole bunch of ISBNs. And uh, I love that model because I didn't have much money and books are always really cheap. Um, so I was oftentimes flipping books that, you know, a dollar into $10 or 12 or $6 profit, whatever, after fees. Um, and just doing that over and over and over. And it really helped me to build my cash flow. So I already had the Amazon account established. Um, one question that a lot of people might have uh, if they've looked into selling games on Amazon is that a lot of the video game brands are gated. Yeah. So when you initially open up your account, you're not able to sell them. And that process uh, for getting ungated is not... Uh, it's not as intimidating as you might think. I have a video on it that I made like three years ago that's still relevant today. Uh, you do have to have a um, uh, an LLC so that you can open an account with an official distributor of mm -hmm. those kinds of products, buy at least 10 units and submit the invoice to Amazon. It's pretty much like they tell you on the site how to go through it step by step. I know there's a lot of people in my Discord who have had success with that method. Um, so anyways... Uh, I was ungated in video games at the time and saw that, huh, like for the most common games that I'm seeing all the time in the most common conditions, uh, they tend to go for more on Amazon. Right. There's certain stuff that doesn't. And that's a question that I get a lot too. How do you determine what goes on Amazon and what doesn't? Basically, if anything has a big condition issue, it doesn't go to Amazon. If it's highly, highly collectible or really expensive, it doesn't go to Amazon. If anything is cardboard, it doesn't go to Amazon because... On Amazon, the weird thing is there's not pictures associated with your specific item. It's just a right. generic listing. Right. Um, so, so that might like, have been a little bit more uh, info than you were looking for. But no, no, I no, have experience absolutely... selling on both. And also uh, last year, I think we did like 160000 on whatnot as well. Nice. So um, when Spencer came on, who was my first employee, at first was just part time, I realized Huh. Selling on whatnot, eBay and Amazon, it's really hard to teach all three of these systems. And ultimately, are we going to probably get a little bit less money for the really high end stuff just selling on whatnot and cutting out eBay? Yes. But the value that we gain in terms of simplifying our overall business structure is going to outweigh that, I think. So at that point, we stopped listing stuff on eBay and just did whatnot on Amazon. And then... Um, over the last year, we've done a little bit less whatnot, and now are really trying to drive home just the Amazon uh, side of things, and have really been seeing some significant benefits from that focus. Which segues perfectly into you know two things we want to talk about. And one is that the opportunities are everywhere. And you said you started you know 
um, going to thrifts, going to garage sales, doing flea markets, pawn shops, um, buying out whole collections, networking, mm -hmm. um, business to business. Now even you're, you have developed an app to buy. So there are opportunities everywhere. And we can't go to develop an app, buy whole collections, maybe our very first buy. So there are mm -hmm. levels to it. We have to start you know, buying the onesies, twosies at the garage sales, moving into, you know, walking into a actual brick and mortar video game store, which I've seen you do in your videos where, you know, you you go to a place called Matt's Games and that guy, he's a professional game seller. And even you have the skills and the knowledge to find a little bit of arbitrage in there due to Amazon being a higher price. So that takes a little bit more of an expertise. So for me personally in South Florida, I have never seen a video game one time in a mm -hmm. thrift store. They, they must send them to online Goodwill. I've never seen one. At the flea market, I see them, but everyone knows Super Mario is valuable. Everyone knows Zelda is valuable. When, as soon as a video game hits the table, it's off the table. So you have gone through every iteration of sourcing video games. And there are pros and there are cons with every single one. And there are also, I guess, limitations and walls to every single one. So you can run around the flea market every week, but the flea market's only open two times a week. You can go to all the pawn shops, but maybe people are pawning the bad games and not the great games. You can't do anything with them. You can go over to Matt's games anytime you want, but he's a professional for more or less, he knows what they're worth. Um, and then eventually you build up your bankroll when you get collections, but collections, we, we, we all want to buy collections. We all want to buy in bulk, mm -hmm. but you had a video where you had five tubs of bulk that you had to now offload, which essentially no one really wanted to pay a good amount for mm -hmm. because you've bought the collection, you've cherry picked all the good stuff, that stuff went to Amazon and now we're left with, with the leftovers. So a lot of people wanna buy bulk, but you need to have some sort of secondary outlet to deal with the leftovers. And for you, whether it was eBay or whatnot or bringing it around town as an experiment like you did. And then after mm -hmm. that, we do the business to business and that is finding a client for items that we are going to purchase or, hey, I have a deal lined up. Let me see if Caleb wants this. That's the business to business, kind of like that pass through. And then now you have an app where people can submit their collections and then receive a price. So that's a lot. But I guess take us through kind of the steps, the limitations, and I guess the growth and the troubleshooting to get from one step to the other. Because everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people want to get to the top of the mountain. But in order to get to the top of the mountain, you got to start at the bottom and you have to troubleshoot and, and find ways through every single one of these iterations that do come up. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So video games is a somewhat unique category. I don't know how many people uh, in the group are in niches where that are similar in that everyone wants to buy video games. Everyone. Right? The, the everyone only knows that one would be Jordan's. Mm -hmm. everyone wants to, Jordans and video games. That's it. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, recently vintage shirts, like in vintage clothing in general has been getting a lot of hype as well, but I would say like, I'm, I'm definitely not a clothing person. Like, even if I see it, I oftentimes will pass, but yeah, everyone knows like the sell through rate, the demand, the prices on games are really good. So even if it's not your niche, oftentimes if you're a reseller, you'll pick it up. So pick it up. the yep. biggest challenge for most video game resellers is inventory acquisition which is uh, how like that's what you have to solve for no matter what stage of the process you're in. So the first way that I would acquire uh, inventory very early on was yard sales, just going super early, uh, trying to hit community sales so that you can have the uh, like highest number of sales that you're seeing per day, asking it every single one, do you have video games? Um, and that I would usually come away with at least some video games from a solid you know, seven hours of sourcing yard sales yeah. on a Saturday or Friday. Um, but it was not consistent. So it took a long time. And if I was only specializing in video games, if I wasn't also buying other categories that I was finding that were low hanging fruit along the way, uh, it would have been really hard. Like, I don't think I could have sustained a full business just on finding video games specifically at yard sales. Um, from there, I did also some sourcing on uh, Facebook Marketplace. Um, buying people's like lots and stuff that were like maybe slightly under market value and then trying to negotiate or seeing, can we do like a trade or something like that? Um, and I've also done like trade posts on Facebook marketplace. So like, Hey, I have this brand new switch for trade. If anyone wants to trade their like retro game 
like collections. That's something that uh, in the early history of my channel, I made a lot of videos on. And at the time, I didn't see anyone else. Like it was a pretty novel idea. Um, I'm sure there have been other people that have done it, but definitely no one on social that I saw. Um, and since then, it's become a pretty common method for people to um, be able to buy things that aren't for sale. Yeah. Right. So these people that they're doing deals with, they're not making posts that are like, hey, here's my video game collection. I wonder who might want to buy it. A lot of them don't even necessarily think those things are valuable at all. It's been collecting dust in a closet. But when they see a shiny switch or PS5 in front of them, it gets their wheels turning. Oh, I do have that Dreamcast lot. I wonder if he might be interested in that. I don't know. And it turns out it's like 900 bucks worth of vintage Dreamcast games, right? Sure. Um, so that was another iteration that uh, by the time, by the end of 2020, I saw a lot of other people in my area specifically doing that. So the competition had risen and I was having to go through more and more messages to find a decent deal. Um, so from there, but the good thing is throughout 2020, the opportunity at video game stores and also at conventions, once those open back up, that's another mm -hmm. big way that I've uh, done sourcing. Um, those are two avenues that I think most people would be surprised by. Yeah, uh, I'm surprised by that one. That I'm so big and it's such a channel motto for me. Opportunity is everywhere is a lot of people assume that there's less potential for collaboration between different kinds of resellers than there really is. And this is yeah. something where, especially if you're starting out reselling and you're watching this right now, I would take a note on this because a big, I'm trying to workshop the wording on this right now, but a huge philosophy of mine is to collaborate, don't compete. Even yeah. among people who are in the same niche as you, there might be opportunity for like, maybe you have different specific specializations and you can do trades, right? Of your inventory. They really like, maybe you're both in vintage shirts. They really like AOPs and you really like the obscure stuff. And like your whatnot audience uh, is very Kentucky heavy. And so you can pay really close to market rate for all the Kentucky stuff. And they really like your stuff. That's from, you know, the West coast that you get randomly. And if you have a mindset going into whatever niche you're in that like, this is my competition, I need to keep them at arm's length and do anything that I can to get an edge up on them and push them down in the process, you're going to miss the opportunities for collaboration and making each other money along the way. And not to mention reselling just becomes a lot more lonely when you're stingy with your time, with your resources, your information. Um, I've, I've found, I can't tell you the amount of money that I've made because I'm generous with people in terms of the prices that I'm willing to give them. First of all, I try to pay people really well. I try to be the guy at the convention that shows up with donuts on day two. And like, you know, is just uh, doing small things to, to win people over. And gosh, like not only does it just make the process feel way better, but it makes you so much more money. Like, being the kind of person that people love to work with, even yeah. though technically you are competing, right? You're trying to sell the same stuff to the same buyers. You're trying to buy the same collections out there. Like I want to have other people locally that I know that can sell when I get a complete N64 collection that's all complete in box and I don't have a great way to move that anymore. I want to have someone that I can sell that to for a fair price quickly, right? And make maybe just 10% flipping it wholesale but then I can move on and maybe we can trade and they can give me right. your 20 copies of Wii sports. Cause I sell, I'll probably sell those all in a day on Amazon. Right. Um, right. So I get kind of worked up when I talked about, talk about collaborating, not competing because having that like just abundance mindset and genuinely believing that there are partnerships out there that you can forge if you're just kind to people and generous with your resources. Gosh, it, it's just so profitable. Yeah. And so like you and I, we speak a lot of the same language. And a couple of videos ago, I, I mentioned that something that I learned in my journey is that the people on the top, they collaborate. The people on the bottom, they compete. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more like crab in a bucket mentality on the bottom, but it doesn't have to be like that. Right. Because because there's different levels to the top. You, you could be at the top of the lower level and you can collaborate with those people and bring each other up to the top of the mid level bring each other up to the top of the top level and there's even a level above that and yep. one of my biggest regrets i i was a lone wolf for over 10 years in reselling i i was a lone wolf i didn't talk to anybody i i didn't do anything and while while it did work 
I think that if I did collaborate more, I think that my progression would have been way, way faster because like you're saying, this is what I would have done. And th yeah. this is what I, th this is what, what I tell people who like go to the bins as an example at the bins. Yeah. They have the vintage guys there. All they want is the shirt you're wearing and they're still, they will stand in the bins for 10 hours and they'll wait for that shirt. Right. They will touch 1500 Tommy Bahamas this week. Look at them and throw them back. They will exactly. touch a thousand vineyard vines. Look at them and throw them back. Mm -hmm. 150 pairs of Levi's today. Touch them and throw them back. Fine. You give them the vintage, the, the vintage Disney shirt that's worth 300 bucks, mm -hmm. and you get $300 worth of Tommy Bahama, but it's not $300 sell value of Tommy Bahama. It's $300 buy value of Tommy Bahama, which turns into $1,500 or $2,000 Tommy Bahama that costs you $1.00 because you had to give them one Mickey Mouse shirt that they liked and they went crazy over or yeah. one Carhartt jacket that would have sold for 200. Sure. You said, Hey, this is worth 200. Give me $200 worth of good eBay items. I'm not talking 200 sale value. Cause that's going to get you where you want to be $200 by cost of these great eBay inventory. And I'll do that trade. And you can turn 200 into maybe 2000 mm -hmm. and you really turned five actual dollars of a Carhartt jacket into $2,000. And that is what you're talking about right there. And that is where my business exploded. Mm. My business exploded once I started networking and collabing with the people that had all of this stuff. And I found a way to provide value for them. And they found a way to provide even more value for me due to the trade. And that is a huge thing inside of my business. And the, the, the thing that people say is that they go, well, if I teach them all my brands, what's stopping them from just selling them anyways and, and cutting me out? Well, sure. But what's I, I would rather teach someone everything and have them work with me forever than to not teach them everything and have them work with me forever. So yeah. the, the, there, there are people who just want to source all day. They have no interest in listing, no interest in taking photos, no interest in shipping. And there are more of those people than there are people that are going to take everything that you know and then start an eBay store. Do you know how much totally. work this is? Caleb, how much work is doing what you do on a daily basis? And, and let's be real. Nobody wants to do this. Nobody <laughs> wants to do this part of it. Everyone wants to buy. Everyone wants to find cool stuff. And everyone wants to get paid. Pay them for the job that they are doing, finding cool stuff. It's going to leave you margin because you need to get paid for the job you're performing, putting it online, you know, paying the taxes, running a real business, buying boxes. There, there, is, there is profit to be made there. But the collaboration has paid off for me to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. Totally. Because now you have, now you can also, you can arbitrage your time. Because like you said, there's opportunity everywhere, but I'm one man. I can only get 120 items a day. That was my peak. You develop this army of people who know that, hey, you're a buyer. I can pick up these items for this person. They can either give me money or they can trade me something good. We both leave happy. This is a great, this is a great relationship that turns into what? Business to business. And yep. when you can start collaborating and, we, and when, you, when you can start getting into those different tiers of business, that's where all the money is to be made. When you get trapped in crab in a bucket, when someone starts doing a little bit better than you and you want to pull them down, you can yeah. only get so far with that. So there's two ways to build the biggest building. One is to build the biggest building and one is to tear down every other building around you. Mm. And it's much easier to build the biggest building than to crash everyone else's building and have your little building left, but it still ends up the biggest. Yeah, that's so huge. And also just psychologically, like with one system, you have 20 rivals, right? And the other one, you have 20 partners. Yeah. Right. Like which, which world would you rather live in? And that actually, like, that's the biggest reason I put so much time and energy into making this app this last year is it's actually not primarily geared towards collectors. It's mostly geared towards resellers to let them know, hey, when they scan like, uh, you know, Mario Kart Wii, it comes up with, okay, in this condition, here's the market value according to pricecharting.com, which is kind of our industry standard. And also right below it, here's what we would pay in that condition. And so they can easily like, add it to a batch and just send us stuff because you're right. Most stuff, most people don't want to do the selling no, and the customer service yeah. and the listing and the shipping. And like, 
I'm, I'm really banking on that because I hope that once people realize they can just buy full time and sell to us, that it'll get addictive really quick. Right. Yeah. And so we're doing everything we can to pay the best possible so that people feel as good as they can yeah. when they sell stuff to us and get paid, you know, the next week. That's pretty much like the full, um, it's like that, that philosophy of partnering with people rather than competing, I feel like has kind of come to fruition in this program. So I'm hundred percent on the same page. Yeah. And that, that one was really huge for me. And, and I think if I would have started collaborating instead of waiting to year 10, if I would have started collaborating in year three, year four, year five, I would have made millions of dollars more in those, in yeah. those seven years in question without a doubt. I would have totally. made millions of dollars more, but I, I was, I was also in the mind state back then. And this took a while for me to break out of. And I don't know if it was due to my upbringing and due to certain situations in my life, but I was in the scarcity mindset for a very long time. Cause yeah. I came from a single mother household. I've watched her work two jobs every single day. I didn't know that there was more out there in the terms of opportunity in the terms of just abundance in the United States of America of waste that we are able to go ahead and sell online. I, I was in a very scarcity mindset until I my listing goal became more aggressive, more aggressive, more aggressive. And I was still able to find the stuff. And mm -hmm. like once I got to 120 items every single day and I was able to find 120 items every single day, that told me there's probably 30 more out there because I, I would always jump in iterations of 30. So I can go to 150. I can go to 180. But when I went from 120, um, the warehouse next door opened up. So I doubled my space. I made my first hire of an employee. Um, the shutdown happened. All the stores closed. And right before all the stores closed, I think um, like like in February, I, I, I made the decision to move to 120 a day to 250 a day. And I doubled my listings because my where my warehouse space doubled. So I figured mm -hmm. if my warehouse space doubled, my output needs to be doubled. So I went to 250. The shutdown happened. And if anyone knows me, I don't go backwards. We're doing 250. I don't care if everything's closed. I was still able to find 250 items every single day with every single store closed down. Did I have to look in different avenues? Did I have to start going to rag houses? Did I have to start networking more? Absolutely. Yeah. But that showed me that it broke me out of that scarcity mindset where the opportunity is actually everywhere. Like my wife and I, when we first got together, one of the things that we did together when we were dating was go on a scrap route. A scrap route is go to bulk trash, drive around the neighborhood, find cool stuff and go home and sell it online. Like wow. that's how much opportunity there is everywhere. Like yeah. I have found Apple II computers that I found in the trash and sold them for 250 the same day. Just the amount of waste, the opportunity that is everywhere is absolutely mind boggling where like you do these things and, and you think that it's finite. You think that there is scarcity in the market, but there's not. In yeah. the United States of America, there is so much waste that we are so blessed to be able to do this every single day where you can find stuff in the trash, find stuff at the flea market, the thrift store. And my favorite thing about all of this is finding something and pulling profit, pulling money out of thin air by doing the work and putting it online. So like mm -hmm. all of those things I had to work through on my own time. The, the Apple computer in the trash wasn't enough for me. The, mm -hmm. the 120 items a day, it wasn't enough for me to break me out of that scarcity mindset. The 250 during the shutdown when everything was closed, that told me this stuff is unlimited. And even for you in your category where, where we would think there are limitations, the limitations aren't due to the product. The limitations is due to the amount of people that are looking for it because everyone is looking for it. As soon as video games hit the table, they get sold. So right. you have had to find ways <clears throat> to pass by those limitations because that is going to be the cap on your business and the limitations of going to the garage sales you said okay now i'm going to go to the flea market i did the same thing and, and and now we're getting into the opportunity cost i used to go to to garage sales and then one day a light bulb went off in my head and said the flea market has 2000 garage sales all in the same place and i don't need to drive all around town and hit and miss i can hit and miss every four feet so mm -hmm. then i started going to the flea market and then, you know, you, you start going to certain thrift stores, you, you start developing a route, you start figuring out 
where can I make the most money with the least resistance? Do, can, can I go to seven garage sales today and spend more time driving than I do actually boots on the ground at the garage sale? Mm -hmm. Or can I drive one time? Maybe it is 45 minutes away and not five minutes away. But now I have access to 2000 garage sales all in a row. But yeah. the most important part is you develop those relationships and then they start bringing stuff for you. Hey, Caleb buys games. I'm going to look for games. I didn't in the past, but I'm going to look for them. Now I get them. Hey, Caleb, look what I got in my car for you. You start developing that. And that is a business to business relationship on a small yeah. scale at the flea market. So that does work. So all of these things, the product is out there. They've mm -hmm. already made the product. That's the important part. They've already made it. And They've now, made every I'll single I'll product. Uh, 130, I go do Thanks. No problem. See you. So they've already made the product. That's the important part. We don't have to manufacture it or make it ourselves. They've also already made the money. We don't have to print the money ourselves. Yeah. We just have to find the product and get a portion of the money. That's all we have to do. So something that you said, which was surprising, was that you go to conventions and you source and you have good luck there. Mm -hmm. When you tell me a convention, my immediately thought is those are collectors. Mm -hmm. And those are people that know everything about the games. Therefore, they're at the they're the convention. Yep. How do you buy from people that know exactly what the items are worth? Yeah, that's a great question. Conventions are a great example. Just I'm thinking about this this topic of like trying to expand people's like opportunity radars, right? To like be able to kind of get that spidey sense tingling. Like, okay, hold on, like. Maybe maybe I shouldn't have such a scarcity mindset here. One thing that I did early on before even going to conventions was um, at yard sales, I found myself oftentimes, because you're pulling up early, right? You have to be yeah. the first one there. Have to be. For um, yep. And oftentimes, you know, you might pull up a half hour early to a sale and see someone walking out with a tote of games right ahead of you. And it's the worst feeling in the world. And one time I just had this light bulb moment, like, wait a second, I should follow those people to their car and make an offer on that bin. Because oftentimes, like if they paid 20 bucks for a bin of PlayStation 2 games, sure. that's worth a thousand. I could pay them 300 and still make a butt ton of money. And they a lot of them will probably be really happy. They might be a jeans reseller that sure. happened to see this. And everybody knows that video games are valuable. So sure. like if they can 10x their money and then I can 3x my money. Wait a second. That's still a really good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would challenge people anytime you start to like resent your competition for something, ask yourself, could there be a deal here? Um, and the same goes for conventions to your actual question, because um, you're right. Almost everyone there, like the prices, it's uncommon. The more knowledge you have, the more possibility you do have to catch things like maybe a variant that's worth way more that the person doesn't really realize. Right. Mm -hmm. Or um a game that has gone up in value a ton this month because some streamer started playing it and now it's an 80 dollars game when it was a 40 dollars game mm -hmm. so there are little singular opportunities that you can find when you just have a deep level of knowledge about the product that's probably true in any niche but the reality is like conventions are very different from flea markets and yeah. that like every yeah. game on the table usually has been looked up at yeah. some point yeah so what you have to do is I have two strategies. One is I focus on the games that I know I can do better on than most people can. So on Amazon, this is like very fast selling games, right? In good, complete, clean condition. Um, those are the things that I target because oftentimes I can get maybe 20% above market. So I can pay like maybe 30%, 25% under market and make a bit of a spread there. And if I do it over and over and over again, we're playing much more of a volume game now. Sure, sure. And the way that I'll get there to that 25% off is I'll say, hey, if I buy like 300 plus dollars worth of stuff from you, do you think you could work like a bulk deal with me? Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. Because yeah. I would say it's maybe, it's probably at conventions two thirds like vocational vendors or like hobby vendors that do it to flip and then maybe one third people with their collections. But in either case, people are looking to move a lot of product at once. It's at a booth. They're not paying fees, right? They paid a one-time fee to be at the convention. So they're looking to move product to justify it. The other strategy that I'll use is waiting until day two. If I'm kind of like, maybe I actually need like a 30 or 40% discount to make my margins. When you wait until the last hour or two before they're about to have to leave, suddenly 
that inventory is looking a lot, uh, a lot less appetizing, a lot less interesting to keep on your table and then have to pack up and then repack again to the next convention or have to go home and list it on eBay. And suddenly people start thinking, what's the least I would take for this stuff? Mm -hmm. How much can you possibly take from me? Um, so just trying to take advantage of those two things, the, the items that I can naturally pay the best for and the times that other people are most motivated to sell are my, my two big strategies for conventions. But a lot of people would like just not go to conventions in general because they think these people all know what they're doing. There's no deals to be had. Meanwhile, like every single convention I ever go to, the vendors during their setup period, they do thousands, tens of thousands yeah. of dollars worth of deals together because yeah. they all know each other. They know yeah. what specializations and what uh, audiences each specific person has and their geography and their method of selling. Yeah. Like the biggest transaction that every any given convention is between vendors. Before it even so opens. Opportunity. Yeah. Before it even opens, there's right. more transactions before it opens vendor to vendor. And they're mm -hmm. going to sell at the same marketplace where yeah. we have a worldwide marketplace and there is an arbitrage to that too. But I think, dude, one of the best questions, could there be a deal here? Mm. Do we ask ourselves that? And when, when you roll up in the dark and you're two minutes late and someone's leaving with a tote of games, mm. like you said, you walk up to them. They could be someone that sells jeans, right. but they saw an opportunity. Hey, yeah, will I take $300 profit just by walking this tote 50 feet, putting it into my car. Yeah, that sounds like a good deal. Or we don't know their cash flow situation. Maybe they need 300 bucks today to pay their bills. Right. Maybe maybe they they spent their last money. They, they came out with 20 bucks today. You give them 300 dry powder and now they got the rest of the day to go out there. So like we don't know everyone's situation. And what's the worst that can happen? They tell you no. And then you say, no problem. This deal didn't work today. But right. hey, here's my information. I buy these things. Give me a ring sometime. And more often than not, I bet your phone rings from time to time for people that you have met in the past. So I think, could there be a deal here? That's a good question mm -hmm. that we should ask ourselves every single time we see somebody, um, see somebody who we think is competition, see another reseller, you know, see, see something somewhere. Could there be a deal here? I think that that mm -hmm. is a, that's a huge takeaway for me too, because you're you're right. At the convention, my first thought was, "Those are professionals. There, there's nothing you can do there." But like you said, you can bundle. You can go at different times. The vendors are there to sell stuff. They're not there to pay the fee and sit there for two days and go home with no money. And mm -hmm. on day one, maybe the price is too high. They made no money. That car ride home is lonely. And day two, the price is going to be a little different. So yeah. it, it's different with everything. But could there be a deal here? So asking yourself that probably. 10,000 times in your reselling um, career has had to be a direct contribution to where you are today. Oh man. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, I mean, just yesterday we went to the PO box to pick up our weekly packages that are being sent to us from other video game resellers in our same niche. And we, we paid out like 15,000 bucks to other resellers who are selling the same stuff as us because there's a deal there, right? There's, there's synergies. We can have a symbiotic relationship and both get what we want uh, while also both making money. It's, it's amazing. So could there be a deal here? So I, I'll even admit, sometimes when I'm at the flea market, I get the vibe that this person is a professional. I get the vibe that they know exactly what their item mm -hmm. is worth. Mm -hmm. And I walk away and don't even ask the price. Mm. Yeah, I think a big a big reason why my percentage of finding deals with other resellers is high is I really pride myself on paying as much as I possibly can. That's Absolutely. a huge thing. Like yeah. if you're, if your budget is still really low, it's going to be a lower percentage because there will be fewer people who like, say you're, you're sniping the person who's coming out with a cart full of great stuff from Goodwill. And yeah. you're, you both love selling Tommy Bahama and they've got 15 Tommy Bahamas. Clearly they're in the same niche. If you go up to them and are like, Hey, uh, this stuff all looks really good. I'd pay 10 bucks a piece for this. Uh, if those are $60 shirts, you're going to have a lower likelihood of that person saying yes than yeah. if they're $20 shirts. Yeah. yeah. But there are some people, like if Tommy Bahama is your thing, you might know how to get $30 for a shirt that's normally 24 for a lot of people because you know yeah. the item specifics, you have a great photo setup, you do a great job with your description, all the stuff, the tactical stuff that you teach. 
if you know all that stuff, you can oftentimes get higher prices than most people could. So if you know your stuff really well and you lead with a really good offer, specifically on the items that you can pay the best for, you're going to increase your likelihood a whole lot. So like if I'm going up to a dude with a tote of stuff, honestly, I might lead with an offer that is higher than I normally would pay for those games. I might, I might estimate quickly in my head, maybe this is like 500 bucks worth of stuff. I might say, do you want 400 for it? Just because honestly, I'll probably break even on that box after fees and shipping and everything. But I'm going to weigh more than break even on that relationship if this dude leaves happy. If he's in Absolutely. my area, he's finding this stuff. Yeah. Guess who he's going to call next time? Absolutely. So that's a huge tip that I would have to people looking to expand their opportunity radars. Pay as well as you can, especially on the first deal. Look for the kinds of items that you can pay the best for and lead with those to leave a good taste in people's mouths and maximize your opportunity for future deals. Absolutely. And so like for, for my videos, you know, I just started YouTube about five months ago and I have a couple different buckets. One of them is the flea market video. One of them is a weekly Q and A and one of them is the podcast. And I've been going to flea markets that are four or five hours away to, from my house. Cause my wife and I wow. were starting to travel a little bit now that yeah, we're yeah, winding yeah. day down. So I've been going to flea markets four or five hours away from my house. And I've gone to a couple of the flea markets now, two or three times within the last mm -hmm. four months. And even though they're four hours away from my house, even though I haven't seen these people for six to eight weeks, they still remember me from eight weeks ago, doing a good deal, paying a good price, not yeah. negotiating with them, you know, being professional, taking a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. They are waving me down from a half a football field away when they see me pushing my little cart because they remember me from eight months ago that I was the guy who did a good deal the first time that they saw me. And yeah. that, that is huge for a lot of my success at the flea market. So, so can you imagine going to a flea market four hours away, going there two times in three months and the reaction, could you imagine going to the flea market that's 45 minutes away that I went to every single weekend of my life for 15 years? Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like you're the president out there. Every single vendor wants to do a deal with you because you've always done them right. And you pay mm -hmm. the good price, you're reliable, You'll be there every single week. You know, you're a good person. You have a smile on your face. You tell a good joke. You ask them how they've been. All of Got that. Lots of cash. Matters. Got money every single time. Absolutely. The money's always good. Or the deal is always good. And they can depend on you. So yeah. inside of the group, we have the number one shoe seller on eBay for pre-owned shoes. And he was doing a call. We, we all asked him questions. He does several million dollars a year. And my biggest takeaway from him was that when he is sourcing, so he's to the level now where, where he's calling brands and he's working deals. Like that's the level that, that he has graduated wow. to. And, and we were talking about, you know, same thing with you. Like how do we graduate to these different levels? As buyers, how do we graduate to different levels? And he said he doesn't look at himself as a buyer. Even when he's buying, he looks at himself as a seller because his job when he's talking to people or when he's doing a deal is he is selling a relationship. Mm. So even as a buyer, he is in sales. He's yeah. selling a relationship because the for us, if we want the best bang for the buck, do we want to source from a new person every single week? Or would we want to source from the same person, one person every single week? And then just have to go one place, get all of our stuff and go home? Or do we want to go to 10 places and get all of our stuff and go home? As eBay sellers, would it be best if one buyer came and bought everything in our eBay store, we put it in one box, send it to them? Or do we want to sell 50,000 items this year and send it to 50,000 people? So for, for him, the, the shoe seller, he wants to have long-term relationships with long-term people. And mm -hmm. He is selling a relationship, selling, this is my business. This is what I can offer. You want to make this stuff disappear? I'm the man for the job. The money's good. I'm a professional. I, I can offer you long-term business. And as you are graduating through these things, it, it, it's difficult to do long-term business with long-term people at a garage sale. They're one and done. You're never going to see them again. One yep. garage sale their whole life or one, one per year. We right. start graduating to, to a thrift store. You can do repeat business with them. You, you can go there and, and, and you can develop a relationship. Sure, the workers will come and go, but they'll take notice of you and, 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 and you can develop that relationship. 
flea market, you can definitely develop those relationships. Totally. I bet now when you go to the conventions, there's a lot of vendors that are happy to see you. You have developed that relationship. Yep. So as you go up the list, uh, go up the, the chain, the collaboration and the relationships become even more so important, especially when we get into, like you mentioned, the B2B. And then at the top of the top, now you are trying to develop an army of resellers all across the country, maybe even all across the world, where you can offer a great relationship, mm -hmm. professional, the money's there, you're dependable. Every time they open up the app, you're ready to pay. And if you can pull this off and develop an army of thousands of resellers, all helping each other, all collaborating, because they're helping you, but you're equally helping them too, because you're right. paying a fair price. And if they choose sell, then they agree that you have chosen a fair price. So everyone leaves that deal happy. So if, if you can pull it off and you can scale this app to thousands of resellers where you're the go-to guy to sell pre-owned video games, what is that collaboration and what is that relationship going to get you? Right. Yeah. I mean, it'll get me a business. I hope, you know, like, often, like businesses are, can be built on very few connections if they're really good connections. Yeah. That's the crazy thing. Yeah. Like, you can literally have one person and it's dangerous, right? The fewer you it have, is. the more perilous it is. Yes. But theoretically, like you can have one guy that sells you an entire business worth of inventory yeah. once a week or yeah. once a month, once sure. a year, you know, sure. if it's the right connection. Yeah. Um, so I, and, I really do. One think of those it. is like, there's a company out there that makes the air bubble for Nike and their one customer is Nike and they probably right. make bajillions of dollars. Now, yep. is that dangerous because they are tied to Nike and Nike can dictate the terms? Sure. But they probably have built a beautiful business. It's in the contract that, hey, we got to do business for 50 years and they could just print print money and, and make air bubbles for that one person. So, yeah, absolutely. So, OK, so we've gone through a lot of stuff, a lot of different ways to get the video games, a lot of different ways to get inventory and there is opportunities everywhere and we have spoken to the opportunity cost to get that stuff and you have to weigh what's the best bang for the buck what is the best bang for the time and you have to develop your business around that now can you develop a business around every single one of these models absolutely you can you could develop a business around anything now the problem that people get into is that just because there's opportunity everywhere doesn't mean we need to take every single opportunity and as resellers, we get into this, this thing where we start stacking a lot of stuff on top of a lot of stuff on top of a lot of stuff. And then we have this big, complicated business. And, you know, there, there's, there, there's two ways to add. One is adding by adding and one is adding by subtracting. So how have you been able to, you know, continuously scale your, your reselling business to over $1 million dollars? You've been able to scale your YouTube channel to over 400,000 subscribers, getting huge, huge numbers. How have you been able to do all of this, develop an app, develop business to business, still be out in the streets getting stuff, making deals with hundreds, potentially thousands of people, and you're one man in one bedroom, just like everybody else? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And it largely has been through addition by subtraction. Um, one concept. So my motto for 2023 and honestly going honestly into 2024 is do less better, do less better. And that's taken all kinds of forms in my business. Um, a concept that really rocked me early last year was I heard about this psychological concept of addition bias that we as humans tend to psychologically want to solve problems more by adding things rather than subtracting things. So the example is a study that they did where they would bring a person into a room and give them 20 bucks. And their goal is to get a ball to balance on a table. But the problem is the table only has one leg. So it's just like sitting there crooked on the floor, the balls on the floor, and they've got all of these table legs sitting in the corner. And they say, you can buy as many of those $5 table legs as you want, your goal is to get the ball to balance on the table. And 90 something percent of people would buy two to three table legs and walk out with less money rather than just taking off the table leg that's already there to make the table flat, right? <laughs> and put the ball on it. Okay. 
And that illustrates, there are other examples, right? Other studies yeah. that illustrate the same thing. It's repeatable, but it shows that we tend to, when confronted with a problem, we ask, what can we add to fix it rather than what can we take away? And so a lot of what this last year has been for me is trying to combat that psychological tendency by very consciously asking myself, what needs to be taken away from this business to get to the next level? So a couple examples of that from this last year are in June, July or so, we stopped taking consoles, which to a lot of people is crazy because consoles are high dollar. They sell incredibly quickly. They check a lot of boxes. But for our operation with the volume of items that we were starting to get in from other businesses at, you know, between conventions and people shipping us stuff and buying collections. I realized that, and this goes back to the opportunity cost, the opportunity cost of processing a console was very high because it takes so long. Because when you get a console and you have to clean it and you have to test it and you have to find all the cords to go with it and you have to test the controller to pair with it. And then you have to package it all correctly in a large box with a ton of bubble wrap pack it up, and then you can send it off to Amazon. Whereas with a game, you inspect it. If it looks bad, you test it, and then you ship it out the door. So even though the margins on paper looked really good for consoles, right? Like we're paying 40 bucks and maybe it sells for a hundred or something after fees on Amazon. That's a great margin. When we factored in the opportunity cost of that time, we realized, wait a second, I could process 20 games in the time that it takes to do one console. And even if those 20 games are only $10 profit a piece, that yeah. equation is still very positive. Yeah. So by cutting out consoles from the list of things that we take in our business, we were able to take it to the next level because we were focusing only on the most profitable activity for that given time. Um, yeah. I could give you a couple other examples, but yeah, a, doing less better, gosh, it's absolutely huge. And it's a big reason why we were able to go from around 600K in sales uh, in 22 to 1.1 million in 23. And your example is the same example that Jack gave last week on the podcast, Video Game Sourcing. He's the one that hosts the video game Amazon call in the group. And mm -hmm. he, he, he did the same exact calculation. He could process two video game systems per hour, and maybe he makes $100 each on those. Or he knows he could process 60 games an hour that even if he makes $10 off of those, it's 600 versus $200 profit per hour. And that is the opportunity cost. So yeah. it, is it great to have that super high ASP and sell two consoles? Great. Looks great on Instagram. Mm -hmm. But Jack's bank account and your bank account is going to look much better when it's $600 an hour versus $200 an hour. So do less but better. The addition by subtraction, I think, is a huge, huge, huge key. And I think for me, my entire life, it's been very easy for me to say no. Mm -hmm. I say no 99 times before I say yes one time. So for 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 people, and I, I know this is a struggle for a lot of people, saying no to opportunity is a struggle. I guess, how do you, you, you gave one example where you looked at the data. That, that was a time and a, 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 a monetary data. You know, this much time will give me this much, much money. So what kind of helps you to say no to things that are going to make you money, are going to make you profit, or maybe you don't go to flea markets as much anymore. You've said no to those, but, mm -hmm. but, but, but Caleb, you've made... $250,000 in your reselling career going to flea markets. Yeah. So at the time, that was the best opportunity for you. That was your best opportunity cost for time and for money. But we graduate and, you know, the we, we, we all have this idea of, you know, we're here, we want to get here. And we have this line. That's not how business works. This line ends up going like this, curly cue and flipping around, going back yeah. and forth. And eventually we end up where it's going to be. So at certain times in our life, certain times in our reselling career, some things are valuable. At certain times in our reselling career, we graduate from those and they're not as valuable. So like for me, at once upon a time, I had a thrift route. It was 55 stores per week. I went to the flea market three times a week. And on Saturday and Sunday, I went to two, two flea markets. At that time, that was my best opportunity. When the shutdown happened and I learned to, um, to collaborate, 
and I learn to leverage my money a little bit once I have built the bankroll and have people go out and source for me, now it doesn't make sense for me to go spend 70 hours on the road going to, th to 55 thrift stores, going to three flea markets, because the most valuable I am to my business is sitting my butt in this chair and listing perfect listings for the inventory that I'm getting in. Now, yep. was that my most value day one? Absolutely not. Was that my most value year three? No. But it, it takes time to graduate to get to certain levels. And you do have to say no to the bad things. And you have to say no sometimes to the good things. Because you have made thousands and thousands of dollars selling video game systems. Mm -hmm. But sometimes this stuff holds us back from truly greater things. Yep. And the, the beautiful thing of it is like, for other people who do have systems in place, ideally who have more labor, consoles are a fantastic thing to buy because they yes. do sell so fast, Absolutely. right? So if, and if you have a, you could easily set up a system that's way better than mine for testing, prepping, listing and shipping consoles. I just don't really have the space and the manpower, but I can start sending that business to other people who are also in my niche. Yep. It's another example of opportunity being everywhere because they're going to be great, super grateful to me. Maybe they'll trade me their games that I love to sell for those Absolutely. consoles. Yep. And it's another opportunity for partnership. But Absolutely. the question that you asked is a really good one of how do you know? How do you know when to cut something out? And I would say the biggest metric that you have to look at, that you have to have data on to make that decision, if you're looking at should I... Does it make sense for me to cut out Goodwills and instead just focus on flea markets? Right. The numbers that you have to have to make that decision are what are the dollars per hour that you end up making at those respective locations? So the, the primary metric that you have to know is what is my single most profitable activity per yeah. hour? Yeah. yeah. And once you know that, you can start comparing every other activity in your whole business to that number. So maybe it takes, maybe I do have to drive two hours to a flea market, but every time I do, and I spend six hours sourcing there, two hours each way, that's 10 total hours. If I come away with $3,000 profit, guess what? That's of sourcing. Yeah. What is that? 300 bucks an hour. Now yeah. you would have to also factor in the listing time and stuff like that. But if you're comparing it just to other forms of sourcing, yeah. maybe you instead stick in your town and spend 10 hours, you don't have any travel time both ways. So you spend just that 10 hours going to yard sales and thrifts and you come away with 2000 in profit. Suddenly it starts to seem a lot more, uh, a lot more effective and efficient to actually drive the two hours to go to the place where you can get more stuff. Absolutely. Now you, have yeah. to, you do have to be a little bit careful to not take a small sample size and like only one weekend sure. as right as your metric. But I would definitely encourage people to be very thoughtful about tracking how much money are you making at various sourcing avenues, buying different kinds of products, right? Listing versus sourcing these kinds of things, uh, because that data is what's going to help you make the best decisions for what you need to do more of and what you need to cut out. Absolutely. And just this morning, we were going over um, people's spreadsheets and I, I, I was going through the numbers and I, I love going through the numbers. And, I, and that's one of the the, the most important things that we do in the group. So on the morning call, I was asking people, what are you tracking? And mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, they, they track, you know, the number of listings, the number of souls, they track their average profit, they track their average sale price, which is all fantastic and great. Some people have it all the way down to they are tracking their average or they are tracking their total profit per store or per stop. So now oh. that can help you because, hey, at this goodwill, I spend, you know, an hour in there every single week, I walk out with 30 bucks where I can skip this goodwill, maybe go to two other ones. And in that same hour, instead of pulling out 30 bucks, I can pull out a hundred bucks. So like we do need to take, you know, we, we do need to do some accounting on how we are acquiring the inventory because you could be spending a lot of time with not a lot of payoff and not only for, for the stores. I mean, we, we should be accounting for every single minute that we put into the business, because if we are putting in 10 hours a day with two hours a day of results, we need to really take a look at that and we need to see where our time is going. And if we had a time audit sheet and if we tracked wasted time, for a lot of people, that would be the largest category. Mm 
-hmm. And we need to chisel away. We need to whittle away at that wasted time column on our time audit. And yep. we need to use that time more wisely because if you can spend eight hours a day working on your business and you can show eight hours of results in reselling with a hundred percent ROI, 500% ROI, we've all bought something for a dollar and sold it for a hundred ROI. Mm -hmm. If we can truly get eight hours of effort and show eight hours of results, the results after that compounding for a couple of years is absolutely ridiculously crazy. And that brings us right back to the beginning of, of there is opportunity everywhere and Absolutely. our opportunity costs. We need to make sure that we are putting our attention towards what actually moves the needle versus what does not. So this morning we were looking at Karen's sheet and she has all of her categories broken down. She was able to see that even though she sold bras, the profit wasn't there. For her, maybe it's better to sell sweaters and focus on sweaters and make that profit. So she was thinking about eliminating a category that she spends a lot of time in. She has a lot of them in her store, but like she's not, there's a disproportionate amount of sweaters being listed to sweaters being sold mm -hmm. to this widget being listed, this widget being sold. So on the surface level, we think, hey, I'm selling a lot of this item, but that's because it's disproportionate in your store. You have exposure of a thousand units where on this particular category, you have exposure of 30 units, but you have sold 27. Well, let's put more fuel on this 30 units. And imagine when you get a thousand of those units in your store, you'll be rocking and rolling. So like the last five minutes of this has been like probably an overwhelming amount of stuff that we have to track and we have to keep track of. But like, let's face it, we're running businesses here. The, the, this is part of the gig. And even if you are doing a hobby, the IRS is looking at it as a business. So like you better treat it as a business. So if we volunteer, you know, we sit down and we take the reseller oath. Mm -hmm. Part of that oath is being in control of our numbers. Yeah. And if we don't know our numbers, if we're scared to look at our numbers, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And I, I always ask this question on the morning call, like, what in your business are you scared of? Mm -hmm. That's what we need to look at. And a lot of people, they're scared of their numbers, and that's okay. They are intimidating. But once you get a fundamental understanding of them, you will run a much better business. So we, we need to be in control of our numbers, our finances, and our time. If we can be in control of those three things, it's smooth sailing after that. Yeah, that's so huge. Well done to Karen for tracking those in the first yes. place. And I yes. think what she'll find, what I have found at least, is that when I start cutting things out, I feel relieved. I feel like the sense of satisfaction when your business actually becomes simpler because you've been putting in the work to look at the data, yeah. it gets addictive. Suddenly you start looking for, wait a second, what are the other inefficiencies that I can cut out? Because having less stuff cluttering my mind and my business process, having less kinds of inventory to find boxes for and mm -hmm. less kinds of listings to know the item specifics for and less sections of the thrift store that I have to go to to find, like, it's so nice. Yeah. Like yeah. we can, we can get really caught up when we're trying to solve problems by adding things. Uh, it can lead to a really chaotic and hectic business. And Absolutely. when you start to go the other way, once you do kind of, you dabbled in all the categories, you know, the direction that you want to go, it can feel so relieving to start to really hone down, find your niche, find your system the thing that you like to do and that you do really well. Oh my gosh. It can, it just, it feels like a weight's been lifted off when suddenly you, you need one kind of box and yeah. you only need item specifics for two kinds of categories and the kind of research that you need to do shrinks and yeah. the kind of storage that you need to do shrinks. Yep. It's just, I, I love it so much. So Karen, I'm really excited for you. And, and those inefficiencies that you mentioned, the more inefficient your business is, the more times you're going to have eight hours of work with two hours of results. If you could be efficient, you'll have eight hours of work and eight hours results. Like you said, you have a dedicated box. You have a dedicated storage situation. You don't need to research every single item you're listing. You're already familiar with the item specifics. You can sell similar off of another one and do a little bit of data entry and boom, there's the listing up. And then really and truly, you look at your day and, and you smoked it today. And the more we can get on that end of the spectrum, rather than being inefficient a lot, that is really going to drag down our business. That's going to drag down, like you said, the profit per hour. Um, and and only until we we become 
efficient, can we actually calculate that opportunity cost to know what direction we should be looking at? So like all of this stuff comes full circle and like, here's my notes from today. This might not make sense to you, Caleb, but all of this makes sense to me. My two biggest takeaways are, could there be a deal here? And I am going to make a commitment to you. I'm going to do a better job of that because mm. I go to the flea markets and there are times where I go, I don't think I have a shot at this. And I'm right because I walk away. Right. And I don't have a shot of it because I didn't ask. And at least I should ask because one of them that sticks in my head, I went to Webster a couple of weeks ago and this lady had two very cool 1970s. One was a Jimmy Buffett tour jacket. And one was an Eagles 1970s tour jack. And I go up and I look at them and she told me the whole history about them. And because she knew everything about them, I assumed that it was going to be too much. Yeah. And I, I said, they're very cool. And I walked away. When I circled back 45 minutes later, both of them were gone. So the price was right for somebody. Yeah. And all I had to do was ask the price and say, no, thank you. It's not for me, but they're very cool. But right. I didn't even I didn't even get to the point where could a deal could a deal be done here? Well, and I'll I'll give one more tool for people's belts if you're looking to do more deals. A really great question to ask if you if you haven't set up many of those partnerships, if you're going to places like flea markets or conventions or whatever where you're interacting with other kinds of resellers, is hey, what's the kind of inventory that you like dealing with the least? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because suddenly, if there's a little bit of overlap there it's a great opportunity to just jump in and say, oh, you hate hats? Dang, I'm a hat guy. That's yeah. amazing. Like, right. do you have like a box of death pile hats that I could maybe go through? I'll, I promise yeah. I'll give you the best number I possibly can and maybe we can both win from this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to piggyback off of that, what you said a minute ago is you're not set up to do the consoles, but you are passing them off to somebody who is, who has a huge exactly. team and they are doing the consoles. So- just because you don't do consoles, you're still out here buying deals that involve consoles. Mm -hmm. you, you haven't eliminated those from, from, from what is possible for you, but you have taken those. You have found somebody who is efficient at doing this and has built a business around this. It doesn't work for me. That's my pain point. I don't want to test and find cables and I don't want to do all that. That's my pain point. Let me identify somebody that I, that I can do something with if they want to trade, if they want to buy, fine. Yep. And we could do that for every single thing as buyers and as sellers. Like you said, when, whenever there is a relationship, because, all right, if Caleb, he walks into a convention and he goes, okay, I want all your Super Smash Brothers for the cheap. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Right. But if you want Super Smash Brothers, but you're willing to take Wii Sports Resort, mm -hmm. that works because someone's going to have... 50 copies of Wii Sports Resort that nobody locally wants, but for whatever reason, it sells like hotcakes on, on Amazon. Yep. So you have, you have helped their pain point, and that's where their relationship comes from. We have to be able, because I, I can't go to the clothing sources and go, give me all your Tupac rap tees for the cheap. That doesn't work. But if I take all their Vineyard Vines, all their Tommy Bahama, all their Nike Dry Fits, all their Peter Millar, sure, now I have leverage where I can get that great stuff for a good price that still works with me because their pain point isn't getting rid of Super Smash Brothers that sells in one second on eBay if you price it right. That's no one's pain point. Their pain point is the stuff that sits that you have figured out a way to monetize quick enough for your business. And that's how the business to business relationship works. And that's the, kind of the reseller circle of life. If, if you have access to stuff that you don't wanna deal with, pass it along to someone else, collaborate, don't compete, Caleb, all of this stuff is circling back, all of this stuff making sense. And you know what? It's funny how that works, right? Yep. It all comes around and that's how the reseller world goes around and that's how everyone makes money and that's how money keeps circulating because we can't keep the money. Otherwise, the economy stops. The, the, the money has to keep circulating. We got to keep everybody going. And if we're growing, people around us grow. And as long as I'm going to the top, I'm going to help people come to the top with me. And you seem like the same kind of dude because as your business grows, there's got to be 10 other businesses that that feed off of yours that can grow just as good as yours. So I, I think what you're doing is great. I think the way you're going about it is great. Um, like I said, my biggest takeaway is could there be a deal here? I am going to make a commitment to you and I am going to start asking that question to myself and to people mm -hmm. more often because what, what's the worst they can say? No. And then yep. I'm OK. I'm still breathing. I, I could still do the podcast next week. I'm OK. 
And then also, do less better. Those are my two. Out of all of these scribbles, those are my two. I can read all of this, Caleb, believe it or not. I got Why it. Why are there so many scribbles? Because I'm crossing stuff off, but I can still read it. That's why I went around my sheet and brought it all full circle. That's just how I operate, Caleb. All of my papers are like that. Like, I could read this. I know what this says. I got it under wow. control. Um, so, yeah, this was excellent. Um, what I want to know is you got this app. You, you, you want to have an army of sellers out there. Like, what does the next three, five, ten years ultimately look like for Caleb and the Caleb machine of, of a huge social media business and a huge reselling business? Because it's hard to do both, my yeah. friend. No, it, it really is. Um, and in order to justify the time that it's taken to make one up, to make the app, yeah. um, I've had to cut a lot of stuff out. So part of what it looks like on the social media side is I went down from uh, two videos a week to one a week, and now I'm down to two a month. Okay. Um, so I'm posting less, but I do believe the videos have been better. Nice. Um, so I've had really solid overall returning uh, people returning to my videos and watching everything. So really happy to report that uh, we're now selling less on whatnot. We're pretty much just focusing on Amazon. That was another thing that I cut out. Um, and I also, I was doing a good number of sponsorships on the channel, but now I'm trying to basically just sponsor myself by talking about the app in place of that, because that also cuts out a lot of work um, that I have to do that. Honestly, I never really liked in the first place. So um, I hope that the next one to three years involves just a lot of making one up better. Like I just, I want the app to be kind of my gift to the video game reselling community. And also to myself, I hope that it makes us a bunch of money and, you know, grows the business. Mm -hmm. um, but just to put another tool in people's belts and another way to do more of what they love, which is usually sourcing and less of what they hate, which is customer service and listing and all that stuff. Um, and I, I very much see it not as the kind of thing that like I put a bunch of effort into up front and then kind of ease off, but rather something similar to the channel and the business that I'm constantly striving to make better in any way I can getting a ton of feedback, asking people what sucks about it and trying to fix it. Um, and on the channel, I'm really excited because, uh, I've been doing more content that involves going and seeing other kinds of collectibles related businesses and learning from other people. So previously it's been mostly just me and my collection and my business. And, you know, let's go do another bulk deal at another convention. Um, but I was telling you, maybe there's potential for collaboration with seeing your operation at some point in the future when I'm in town. Um, let us know in the comments if you guys would like to see that. And uh, I'm really looking forward on the channel to just being able to spend more time highlighting other people's businesses and just being more of a sponge, right? Mm -hmm. Learning more and more as I go. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much what I hope the future looks like for us. Our goal is maybe 1.5 million on Amazon this nice. year. Nice. That'll depend a lot on, you know, how the partnerships go, how much people like the app so far. It seems like we're getting really good feedback, but you know, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, all this sounds great. And you know what, in, in order to do great things, sometimes you have to, you know, invent stuff, you know, revolutionize things. And like, for you to develop your own app, I, I can't even begin to, to think about the undertaking that 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 had to be. But that could revolutionize the space. And if you were the first one to do it, the smartest one to do it, maybe not the first one, but even the best one to do it, sure. that will absolutely pay off dividends. So I, I have the utmost respect for people that see a problem, solve a problem, get it figured out. And I hope um, I hope it, it's beneficial for you and your business. And I just want to say thank you for you spending a, a, a little bit of time with us. I, I think that this was a hugely, hugely valuable conversation to me. So I, I, I can only hope that um, everyone that listens to it agrees. And I thank you very much for being on the podcast with me and spending the time and, and reaching out and even, you know, being open to do it. And um, if there's anything that you need from me or anything that I could do to return the favor and help you, I'm always there. Um, anything you need at all. I, I just appreciate you coming through. So thank you very much. If you have anything you want to say to wrap it up. I appreciate um, that a ton. I would just say uh, if, you're saying 99 no's for every yes. I really appreciate you saying yes to me. So yeah. thanks for having me. It's been a blast. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Caleb. Be great.